Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is our final week of 15 and 15. We're here every day at noon, Monday through Thursday, so feel free to join us. Um, and I'm really excited to have Amy presenting today on energizing the lecture. Um, this time of the semester is a great time for a quickie like this. So go ahead and take it away, Amy. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So energizing the lecture, three ways to enhance student engagement. So I just want to start by saying that I think, you know, over um, the past, I don't know, I guess maybe decade or so um, that, you know, active engagement teaching strategies have become really at the forefront of what we discuss so often in regards to best practices pedagogically. Um, you know, I think a, a, a misconception that often comes up is that lecture is not an engaging way, right? Lecture is not, we're, we're not actively engaging our students when we lecture and trying to get faculty to kind of move away from a lecture method and adapt more active engagement strategies. Um, and I just want to take a moment to just clarify some things there because I think lecture absolutely can be a means of actively engaging students. Um, I think as with any kind of teaching strategy, it can be executed well and it can be executed poorly. Um, so when folks are lecturing, right, like there are absolutely things that we can do and things that we can incorporate into our lectures um, to ensure that we're in to, to help facilitate engagement amongst our students. Um, I think a lot of the disciplines that we all teach in, um, you know, depending on the content that you're teaching, lecture might be a very appropriate mode of, um, you know, teaching information. So, um, the three methods that I'm going to discuss today um, briefly are ones that can be used in person or they can be used remotely. They can also be used, um, you know, if you're teaching asynchronously. So even if you're recording lectures ahead of time and, you know, with the intent of students watching them later. Um, so the three methods are multiple choice questions throughout the, le the lecture, um, the think pair share method, and then kinesthetic engagement. So multiple choice questions throughout the lecture. So this is one that I use pretty consistently and I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from students. Um, even students, you know, who tend to be really shy and a lot of times are more hesitant to engage with peers, especially if they're not, you know, comfortable um, sharing things out in class and such really tend to gravitate and, and tend to, um, speak positively about this method. So I'll embed multiple choice questions into lectures generally at three points throughout. So one at the beginning, generally multiple choice questions at the beginning of the lecture are there for the purpose of briefly reviewing past material, especially past material that carries over to what you're doing in the current lesson. Um, it acts as a great way to check for understanding as well of pre-class assignments. So if the students had reading to do ahead of time, especially something that's going to be important for understanding the material for that given day, um, it's a good check-in for students. Also kind of cue students in without calling them out if perhaps, you know, they didn't do the assignment and all of a sudden they're realizing, oh, okay, I should have done that. I understand that it's actually important for what we're talking about today. Um, throughout the lecture, so generally, uh, best practice is suggested to embed these approximately every 15 minutes or so. So kind of after you finish every like subsection or so of your lecture. Um, and just to check for understanding of the material you just went over and we're working kind of at the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy here um, in regards to, you know, knowledge, um, foundational knowledge, not necessarily critical thinking. Um, and then also at the end of the lecture, so it's a great way to wrap up um, to see if students are understanding key points, key terms, key concepts. Um, so the reason why it's helpful for learning is because it helps to uh, facilitate long-term potentiation. So very briefly, long-term potentiation is essentially what happens at a neurological level in your brain that converts information that students use and, and, and store in their short-term memory to actually learning the material and having it in their long-term memory to then be able to apply it to critical thinking. So it enhances the connection between our neurons. Um, maintain engagement and encourage participation. So it keeps students engaged, right? It also can break up your lecture um, for students that don't do well when they're 
you know, if they perceive that they're being talked at um, for too long of a period of time. Um, an educator can assess student knowledge and understanding, so really get a sense of and gauge, okay, you know, are the students grasping these things? Is everybody answering a certain way that's incorrect? If that's, you know, if students are consistently incorrect, and maybe as an educator, I need to reevaluate the way I'm um, um, communicating. Um, and then students can also monitor their own learning. So the way or a few different suggested methods for embedding or implementing the multiple choice questions um, so that the educator can assess what's happening um, are a few different ways. And this also depends on the mode that you're delivering or the mode that you're teaching. So if you're in person, one method that I really liked was um, using these brightly colored index cards. So this works best if you have a smaller class. I gave each of my students um, a set of four brightly colored index cards that had A, B, C, and D on them, told them keep them with you for the semester, right? And when these multiple choice questions came up, I would have them show their card, okay? Um, you can also, you know, if you don't want to use any kind of, kind of like the bare bones, I guess, method would be just show of fingers, right? So have your multiple choice be one, two, three, and four instead of A, B, C, and D, and just have students show you with their fingers which one they select. You could also use clickers. Um, in uh, on Zoom, I've used the chat feature and you can have students, you know, you can specify, um, I want you to put your answer and send it to me in a chat privately, or it can be to the whole class, depending on what your level, you know, of monitoring and, and privacy of answers would be. Um, then you can also use other free software like Poll Everywhere, Kahoot and Socratic, um, which all have free memberships and also ones that you can pay for that do a little bit more. Um, the next method is think, pair, share. Okay, so that's a method essentially where you give a student, give students a prompt, and then you give them um, a minute or two to think about it themselves. Sometimes you can have them write things down. Um, pair, so then they're going to turn to a partner, or somebody next to them, and share their thoughts. And then share, you're going to ask for volunteers to share and report the information to the class. So it helps to encourage participation and direct peer engagement. Right, it kind of you know, make students um, also can can help in students getting to know different people in the class. You might say, okay, turn to somebody to your left, turn to somebody, you know, um, even rows turn turn behind you, odd rows turn in front of you, something like that. Um, also help students uh, consider the, the critical thoughts of others. Um, helps the instructor, again, gauge student comprehension of material, and then also helps the students, um, you know, gauge their own comprehension again. Um, so best practices for this is that the think time should be approximately one to three minutes, depending on the complexity of, of the question or the prompt you're giving them. The pair time should be anywhere from two to five minutes, just, you know, to really, again, depending on the complexity, but give them a chance to actually hear each other and make sure that they both have time to share. Share time, depending on the size of the class and the length of the class, is usually between five and 10 minutes, again, depending on how many students you're expecting to share out and how much discussion you want to have about the different things that they're sharing. Um, it's ideal for questions that require some element of critical thinking. It's also works really nicely when it's used in conjunction with multiple choice questions. So just an example of how I'll use those two strategies together could be something like this. So in my um, either anatomy class or my orthopedic evaluation class, I'll have you know two multiple choice questions that are at that you know foundational level of Bloom's taxonomy. Um, so what's the primary function of the ACL? Okay. What are the distal attachments of the hamstrings? All right, so asking them essentially to just think about just uh, you know basic anatomy, and then for the think pair share, right? So after we've gone over that, I've also identified what the correct answer is and helped students understand why. Go on to the think pair share. How would activation of the hamstrings help reduce the risk of an ACL injury? Okay, um, so then have them think about that for about a minute. Give them about two minutes to discuss with a partner and then share out. Um, the last strategy is kinesthetic engagement. Okay, so this tool is helpful for learning because any kind of movement. So by kinesthetic engagement, I mean body movement. All right, um, very simply put. So movement increases cerebral blood flow. It also enhances cognitive processing. Um, it stimulates multiple areas of the brain through multi-sensory processing. So anytime we can stimulate the brain through 
different kinds of senses of receiving information, it helps our um, it helps retention of information. Um, integrates kinesthetic stimuli with visual and auditory stimuli as well. So, um, in my field, it's it's uh, it might be a little bit more straightforward to engage students kinesthetically than in others, right? So for anatomy, I might have them, if I'm talking, teaching them about anatomy of their leg, I'll have them, I'll, I'll lead them through a self-palpation of their leg, right? I'll have them find a muscle, I'll tell them what to do to activate it, make sure that they can actually feel it activating, tell them to move in certain ways and observe what happens. Um, I understand that in other disciplines, it's not that simple and straightforward, right? So with your own discipline, think about different topics, different concepts or mechanisms that can be reinforced with body movement, with locomotion, with the use of touch, and or other materials that are readily available in a student's environment, okay? Um, so it might be more metaphorically, right, that you have students stand up and do something with their body if they identify with a certain group or if they can relate to a certain thing, okay? So a lot of different ways to do that. Um, so to wrap up, those three techniques, again, are multiple choice questioning, think, pair, share, and kinesthetic engagement. Um, here's a list of resources, which I've found to be incredibly helpful. This list of resources is also on the handout, and that's it. And I think we have like about three minutes left for questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I also just put into the chat the registration link for um, Amy's hour long version of this, which will have um, lots more detail and ideas. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and um, register for that one as well. Uh, we do have about a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions that they want to launch into the space? Feel free to just unmute questions or comments. Yeah, and Robin, in the hour long one, I'm I'm planning on spending a good amount of time on that kinesthetic engagement one that that comes last because I think that's the one that really takes the most collaborative effort, especially for people to just get creative within their disciplines. Yeah, I can't remember what you were giving before in the collab another another event or something where you were talking about that and you were blowing my mind as a like literature professor, I was coming up with all sorts of amazing kinesthetic ideas that, you know, I have to say are not my norm. So I'm um, super excited for that. Um, I am going to go ahead and end this for today, but Amy and I will stick around for a couple of minutes if anybody needs anything. So feel free to hang out if you have any questions, but thank you. See you here tomorrow, same time, same place. Bye everybody.